Good morning and welcome to the Rapid City Planning Commission meeting for April 21st, 2022. If any member of the audience wishes to speak to an item on the Planning Commission agenda, there are speaker request forms on the table along the left wall. Please fill out the request with the agenda number of the item you wish to speak to and hand it to the staff seated on the left of the dais. At this time, we would also like to ask that if any member of the audience has a cell phone or other electronic device that you either turn it off or turn the ringer to silent. If you need to take a call, please step out to the hallway so the meeting is not disrupted. Items one through six have been placed on the consent calendar and may be approved as a group. Action will be taken on all consent items in accordance with staff's recommendation by a single vote. Any item may be removed from the consent calendar by any planning commissioner, staff member, or audience member for separate consideration at this time. The findings of this Planning Commission are recommendations to the City Council. The City Council will make the final decision with the exception of the following items. Item 5, 22PD018 and Item 6, 22PD020. The Rapid City Planning Commission's actions on these two items are final unless any party appeals that decision to the Rapid City Council. All appeals must be submitted in writing to the Department of Community Development by close of business on the seventh full calendar day following action by the Planning Commission. Are there any items one through six that staff would like removed? Any items one through six that any Planning Commissioner would like removed? And are there any items one through six that any audience member would like removed for separate consideration? Chair would then entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar items one through six in accordance with staff recommendations. All right, Vince made that motion and Eric Heikes seconded the motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number seven. Good morning. This item is a major amendment to a plan development overlay to allow a change of use to wine manufacturing at 940 Kennel Drive. The applicant is requesting exception to reduce the landscaping requirements by 10,410 landscaping points as part of this application. The property is owned by industrial district with a planned development overlay. Farm wineries are considered a condi conditional use in this district. Future land use is light industrial. The property is located north of Highway 44, which is classified as Principal Arterial Street, and east of Creek Drive, which is classified as a minor arterial street on the city's major street plan. Shown here is a proposed floor plan. The existing building located on the site is 13,568 square feet in size. Approximately 60% of the building will be used for wine manufacturing and the remainder will be used for storage. There is no current plan to retail wine from this location. Shown here is a proposed site plan and landscaping plan. As noted, the applicant is requesting exception to reduce the landscaping required. Staff is recommending denial of this exception. Reducing the requirement for an industrial property where no hardship exists would set a precedent for future projects within this area and lessen the visual appearance of the site. On to site photos. Public notice was posted at the property. This is looking north along Kennel Drive. Looking south along that same street looking east along Center Street, and looking west as well. And staff is recommending that this item be approved subject to the stipulations outlined in the report, and I'd be happy to take any questions uh, the Commission may have. Thank you. Just for clarification on the landscaping item, the stipulation is listed, 83,571 is the re required number, not the requested number by the applicant. Yeah, that is correct. The 83,000 is the required. Okay. Mr. Chair, if I might expand 50? on that. Thank you. So um, I don't see the applicant in the audience. Oh, 
Well, hello there. Uh, so Bob Fuchs, uh, who has worked wonderfully with the city and done some great things in our community, especially in our downtown area, uh, had requested the exception, noting that this is an area that's, that's really void of landscaping. And they are going to improve the site, but meeting the minimum requirements set forth by ordinance um, is excessive according to what else is out there in the area. We acknowledge that. Um, but as the adjacent properties and properties throughout this area develop or redevelop, they too will be required to meet that minimum landscape requirement. If we don't get it now, we will never get it. And this is an area that has been default in uh, visual aesthetic improvement for several years. And we have a great use coming to this property. We would just like to see it finished off with the minimum required landscaping. So we are encouraging you to support our recommendation to deny. Uh, at the same time, we do believe this is the right use on this property. Thank you. Eric Heikes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I support the staff's comments on this one. I think uh, we're setting a precedence, and I think we should probably keep that consistent. Light Industrial does have an option for landscape design that allows them to buffer the mainly the right away in the fringe on the front frontage. Uh, the, the consideration might include that in the future. Uh, there, there is a bit of a break for light industrial for landscape, so maybe consider that one. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, um, what Eric is referencing is known as a lateral zone, but it's got some uh, requirements in order to utilize it. You have to have a minimum of 50,000 required points and a minimum of 25% of the uh, parameter of the property must abut right of way. And this is kind of a, a unique shaped lot and maybe if you could back up to a slide that just shows the outline of the property. When you do the math and you count the linear footage of, uh, go to the aerial please. There we go, that's the one. So when you start adding up all the lot line links, just looking at what's abutting Center Street is not 25% uh, of the uh, total uh, linear foot of property line. And so they do not qualify for the lateral zone. I stand corrected. Thank you, Vicki. Any other questions or comments on item number seven? Haven? Oh, you're making a move. <laughs> Thank you. I, I guess I was, uh, I'm pretty familiar with this area and haven't been by there many, many times. Um, the additional cost, I don't know whether they've calculated that, the additional cost for, for providing these extra 10,000 or however many uh, points, landscaping points, uh, is there some estimate what that would be? Yeah, a 10,000 landscaping points would be roughly equivalent to 11 medium trees, so trees with a spread of 25 feet, or, or planting about 1,000 yards of grass. So the, those are two examples of how you can make up that 10,000 uh, landscaping points. Mr. Chair, okay. uh, and we don't look at it from a cost perspective. I, I can appreciate that that as an element, but depending upon where you get your material, that cost varies significantly. All right, other comments or questions on item seven? Okay, Karen made the motion to approve item number seven with the stipulations as listed, and Vince seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Item number eight. This item is a major amendment to a conditional use permit to allow the on sale of hard liquor in conjunction with a restaurant at 627 St. Joseph Street. No exceptions are being requested as part of this application. The property is owned central business district and on sale is considered a conditional use in this district. Future land use is downtown. 
The property is accessed by St. Joseph Street, which is classified as a principal arterial street on the city's major street plan. Shown here is a proposed floor plan. The suite is 1,150 square feet in size and will serve food, cocktails, beer, and wine for a target market of 25 years or older. Interior and exterior upgrades are proposed as part of this application and will include updates to the windows, facade, and signage. On to site photos, public notice was posted at the property. This is looking north along 7th Street, looking south along that same street. This is looking east along St. Joseph Street and looking west as well. Staff is recommending that this item be approved subject to the stipulations outlined uh, in the report. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff on the commission? Comments? Haven? I was a little confused with it, with the uh, area that this encompasses. It, if I'm not mistaken, there's a couple businesses to the west on 7th Street, but does this application cover that <coughs> entire building? No, it would be a, a suite within that building, 627. Uh, is this so it's kind of from this photo that you've got here, it's, it would be the, the lot on the east side Mr. Yeah, I, I believe so, yeah. Mr. Chair. Vicki. So uh, what you see in the aerial is just the legal description of the property as a whole. But within that building, it would be 1,150 square foot suite. Mm -hmm. Could you go back out to the street view that you did showing the front of the building? Um, I think you had one that backed it up a little bit, and there we go. So... Um, I don't believe that's immediately on the corner. I think it's one in and uh, on St. Joseph Street. So it would probably be right about in the middle of the property as shown in the aerial, if you'll go back to the aerial. Here we go. So in the aerial? Hey, Justin, if you could step up to the microphone, just we gotta keep our minutes appropriate. So when you get up, just tell us who you are and give us your directions. Hi, I'm Justin, I'm applying for the permit. Um, so in the aerial, if you look at, there's four sections in that coming from 7th Street. The front of the third section would be, and the, only about half of the front of that is the suite that we are talking about. Okay. Presidential pond and the clock shop take up the rest of that back with independent on the right of that. All right, thank you. Any other questions on the application? Karen made the motion to approve item number eight with the stipulations as listed, and Vince seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion to approve? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number nine. This item is initial plan development overlay to allow a school and residential development. No exceptions are being requested as part of this application. This is on non-consent, so we could introduce the project to you, and we'll have this back uh, as part of a final plan development uh, overlay uh, at a later date. The property is located southeast of the intersection of Haynes Avenue and Country Road in a zoned medium density residential district. Future land use is urban neighborhood. The site is accessed by Haynes Avenue and Country Road, which are classified as principal arterial streets on the city's major street plan. As part of this development, the proposed collector street shown in the southern portion of the site will be constructed from Haynes Avenue to the east property line to align with Navaway. There are three primary uses planned for the property, a school located in the center, residential development to the north and south, and a daycare located in the southwest. The K through 12 school will be 135,000 square feet in size and will serve 520 students and 52 staff. Southern residential development includes 20 townhome units, three apartment buildings with a total of 79 dwelling units. A childcare center will be located on the ground floor of the southernmost apartment building and will have 80 children and 15 staff. 
Northern residential development includes 16 townhouse units and 12 single family units. An outdoor performance space for school activities will be located directly north of the school and a loop trail for pedestrian connectivity is proposed throughout the site. The property will be developed in three phases. The first phase focuses, focuses on the southern zone and includes the initial build out of infrastructure, housing and the K through six school. The second phase focuses on the northern zone and includes the housing in the 7th through 12th school. Uh, the final phase includes an expected rezoning from medium density residential to general commercial in the southwest, southwest portion of the site uh, to continue the existing commercial corridor uh, along Haynes Avenue. On to site photos. Public notice was posted at the property. This is north along Haynes Avenue. South along Haynes as well. This is looking east along Country Road and looking west along that same street. Staff is recommending that this item be approved subject to the stipulations outlined in the report and I'd be happy to take any questions the Commission may have. Mr. Chair, um, Tanner could you go back to the uh, site plan that showed the phasing up? Oh, you went past it. It was right toward right there. Yeah, that one will work. Um, could you please uh, circle uh, where the uh, K through six school is going to be located? <clears throat> Just so that you guys really understand what the uses are and where they're located. And then as a part of the second phase, the seven through K or seven through 12 school, Thank you. And then the child care center that's going to be a part of phase one. There we go. <laughs> um, and then the residential components that's also a part of phase one. That one's in phase two. There's phase one. And then, and then there's apartments also in phase one. Yeah. There we go. And then you'll see there's a red rectangle up against Haynes Avenue. There we go. Um, they've identified that in the future that may be commercial. We've put them on notice that in order for that to happen, they would have to plat that acreage out and they would have to rezone it to general commercial. There is support in the future land use plan to allow commercial along Haynes Avenue. But for today, as a part of this initial, they are just bringing forward the phase one and phase two proposal, which includes the school, the child care center, the different components of residential. And if you could also draw a line on that collector street that shows the extension of Neve Way up to Haynes Avenue. There we go. And they're aware too that that would require dedicating the right of way and building that to collector street standards as a part of the um, build out of this proposal. So uh, the applicants have worked with us for several months in bringing forward this application. They've brought forward a, a hefty amount of background information showing the needs uh, in this area of our community for a, a school and for the additional residential development. Obviously, we are all aware of the shortage of residential development we have throughout our region. Um, this is a nice blend. It, it's good to see the outdoor activities that are going to be um, available for the residents and for the children of the school. Uh, looking at this, we uh, ensured that the drop-off zones for both the child care center and for the schools are ones that will preserve safety for the children, that parking is sufficient, um, and then also looking at the landscaping components throughout it to ensure quality of life for those that live there and also enhancement of the, for the children that will be spending time outside. There are some cultural learning activities that will put these children outside for some of their learning. And it's just a unique idea all around. It does create a village within this area of our community. Um, I would like to point out that we did receive one email of objection that's laying on the dais before you. Um, in looking at it though, and in our future land use plan and our city's comprehensive plan, this does comply and is in line with what we would want to see for development within this area. We'll stand for questions. Thank you, Vicki. Any questions for staff on this item? Haven? 
if the application is approved, how restricted are they to the development plan that you've got here in these photos? For example, the one that's up, are they uh, limited to a plan, that plan is shown? Mr. Chair. Dickie. So as Tanner identified, this is an initial plan development. It's just a concept plan. And many developers, when they have a project of this size, they want to make sure that you, the planning commission, are on board with it because it's very costly to do final design. And with an acknowledgment of approval, they will have to submit a final plan development for a public review again. I would assume we'll see a few tweaks in it just because drainage uh, that will have to be designed out may move some of the walking trails as an example. But the general land uses and layout will be the same. If it is uh, different, you will have the authority as a part of the final to give your opinion as to that particular design and land use plan at that time. Typically, they, they stay pretty much in line with the initial. Other questions or comments on the uh, Eric Tychus? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Tanner, could you identify maybe conceptually the drop off circulation for the, the two schools? Yeah, so the drop off would be located directly north of the school. So, right here is the drop off zone. Okay. And then this is the this would be the parking uh, for the school. Thank you. I'll just follow up on that. Oh, Kelly, you go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a basic logistical question. Who will this uh, project serve? Is this a public school? Is this a private school? Uh, is, you know, what are the logistics on this? For such an, it's a big, ambitious project. It's needed, but in in the big picture, who will this serve? Is it open to any residents, local, traveling? How's it work? Mr. Chair, Vicky, this will be a private school, as we have many of them throughout our community. It will be up to their board as to how they screen residents in and out of the school, similar to the many other private schools we have in our community. It's beyond the authority of our of our governing ability to determine um, beyond that, but this is a private school. Same with daycare and housing. Is it all privately funded, privately regulated, privately managed? Uh, I, I don't know if, if that we have the information on the funding, nor do we have the authority to require that or request it, uh, but it will be privately owned and privately managed. So the daycare is probably pr private? As well. all daycares are that get approved okay. through the city. The okay. city does not, we do not have a government daycare or a public daycare. Um, it's, they're all privately owned and operated. Okay, thank you. I just, this is way down the line since it's, uh, well, I guess not. The, the southern building shown along that one to two phasing line How's that accessed? Is that accessed off the southwest entrance? Are you, are you talking about those uh, apartment buildings, sorry? Or the, the school? I think it's the school. The school? I yeah. think you've got different slides that show that a little better, Tanner. Yeah, that would be accessed off Country Road. In fact, the one that you went by. Oh. Uh, yeah. Go back to the one you were just on. I was misreading the one that we were on. A little more building there than I thought. That one, that one makes it clear to me. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you, Tanner. Vince. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on that, uh, that uh, southern end, that on that, that slide you just had up, uh, uh, is that, is that going to be access? And, and then there's that space in between the school and south 
west of it, uh, I guess there was uh, one of the drawings looked like there was a potential orchard there. Is that also going to be an access to that school area from the southern southern side of that building? Yeah, like there is a. Are you talking? Sorry, are you talking this area right yes, here? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, it's a. Yeah, food food slash medicine garden, and it could be accessed from that collector street, and you can see that roadway. Um, roadway through that collector street go up uh, through that apartment, so that's a way that that area could be accessed on the site. Okay, thanks. Vicki? I, I think it's a little confusing because this is a, a lot of acreage, and so the scale of this is a little discerning, but um, what looks like sidewalks are actually uh, driveways, uh, and so they can be accessed in a looped fashion with the drop-off zone. Um, both mm -hmm. uh, from the south and then also from Country Road to the north. Thank you. That's a good one right there. All right. Other events? You good? Okay. Well, certainly an exciting project. Uh, any other comments from the commission? Questions? Motion? All right. Vince made the motion to approve this item uh, number nine with the uh, 15 stipulations. Okay. Is there a second? Eric Heikis seconded the motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10. Good morning, Sarah Hansel with the Planning Projects Division. Item number 10 is the final plan development, file number 22PD007. This is a follow-up from the initial plan development for the Block 5 project, which was reviewed by the Planning Commission on November 24th of 2021. The property is located on the city-owned surface parking lot located between 5th Street and 6th Street, south of St. Joseph Street, zone Central Business District. The future land use for this property is um, public within an area that has a future land use of downtown. And I will note that in a future comprehensive plan amendment, we will be changing this site also to reflect the downtown future land use. Here you can see the major street plan. St. Joseph Street is a principal arterial and as well as the street. Between the initial plan development and the final plan development that's before you today, they have made a few minor changes to the site plan. Um, of note, they've actually shifted the position of the building about nine inches to the west. So you can see the extent of the building generally taking up um, the lot, the entirety of the lot here. In the initial plan, the building was just a little bit further over this way. And as they got further into the design, um, it became um, known that there were encroach subgrade encroachments and so in taking a closer look at that they actually uh, shifted the building um, to the west in order to eliminate the subgrade encroachments so just to point out a couple of features of the building um, the retail space will be about 8,000 square feet here and then they've got the hotel and conference center access to the parking garage will be from fifth street this will be the alley and actually any delivery servicing this development will have their own designated delivery and drop-off area uh, which will certainly eliminate some issues that we experience in other parts of downtowns where you have delivery trucks um, parked in the right-of-way can go back to the site plan if we need to but just to move forward um, here's some elevation sketches showing the property um, this project has completed its historic review so the historic preservation commission has taken a look of, at the proposed materials the height of the building and its overall um, sort of it's fitting in with the downtown nature. They're using a mix of materials. The design is um, highly pedestrian oriented at the ground level. And then of course, with the mixed use element of the hotel center and the residential units, um, this project is adding a lot of vibrancy to the downtown area. So you can see the elevation sketches here. And this would be looking at the back of the parking garage and the south elevation and the east elevation. And the rendering looking from 6th Street and from Fifth Street. 
this application is not requesting any exceptions to minimum design standards. Um, because the project does involve structured parking, it does require review through a conditional use permit, which they're doing through the plan development. Um, and that's the reason why this project is before you. Uh, in their letter of intent, the applicant noted in, uh, that in the future they'd like to have a um, sidewalk cafe on 6th Street, and that will be reviewed separately through the sidewalk cafe permit, and if there are any on-sale uses associated with the retail use, that similarly will come forward as a separate conditional use permit. Um, so there are some stipulations at the report, but overall um, staff is recommending that this item be approved with those stipulations, and we'll stand for any questions that you might have. Oh, you know, I always forget my site photo. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Here you go. If you um, are not familiar with the site, here we are standing at St. Joseph Street looking to the south. Um, here we are looking to the east along St. Joseph Street, uh, looking to the north and down through the alley. Um, here we're on 5th Street looking to the north and uh, over to the east across the street. Okay. With that, we are recommending to approve and I'll take any questions you might have. Any questions for Sarah? I'll jump in. I guess I hadn't noticed this prior. Are we losing parking along St. Joe? Yes, good question. <coughs> so this is St. Joseph Street. This is the proposed site plan. And if I go back to the aerial here, you can see that there are a handful of spaces in this area. With the hotel use located on 6th Street, there is a loading and unloading zone as well as the need to accommodate the right turn lane onto 5th Street. Oops. Um, so because of the right turn motion and this loading unloading zone, there are about seven or eight spaces on St. Joseph Street that are being um, removed from par public right of way in this area. And then similarly with the proposed sidewalk cafe, there's also a few spaces on 6th Street that will be removed as well. Interesting. Karen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sarah, I just had a couple questions. Um, I understand that initially I thought there were, was going to be underground parking, but I thought, how are they going to do that with the, you know, the water level and stuff? So the parking will be like a regular garage that's on that corner. And is there any that will go underground? That's correct. It's all above grade uh, due to the, the water table in that area. The underground parking was not feasible. Okay, thank you. Um, from the uh, picture of the building, any of those pictures, um, I'm trying to, there was a uh, the front of the building, now that's good enough. Where the parking structure is on the very edge over there, is that going to be part of the parking or is that going to be some other use, that very corner there? Let me see if we're orienting correctly. So this is St. Joseph Street here. Right. And this is 5th Street. Right. So this is the conference center. Access to the parking garage will be from 5th Street. Okay. On the very corner of that 5th and, and uh, yeah, that corner there. The, there's, looks like windows along the St. Joe side. Yes. Is that part of the parking garage or is that part of like a uh, retail the, or something? That's part of the hotel and conference center. Okay. Oh, okay. So they're going to have stuff in there. Got it. I understand. Okay. I think that's the only thing. The, the pillar or the corner is access stairways and stuff like that. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Vicki. There are ongoing discussions with our parking enforcement division about seeking compensation for the parking spaces that we are losing, and we're having those conversations with the applicant at this time. Good to know. Eric Heikis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick question, Sarah. The uh, sidewalk cafe, that's an exciting addition to that fabric and that streetscape. Will that be accomplished via um, vacation of right of way or will it remain within the right of way itself? Um, it will remain within the right of way on the sidewalk. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair? Vicki? There's a separate permit that's required for a sidewalk cafe. Those do not come to Planning Commission. The cafe itself is not a part of this application. When the applicant gets to that phase of the development, they will need to work with our department to bring in a sidewalk cafe permit request, and then we will ensure that it meets all the design standards and safety elements for a sidewalk cafe at that time. Oh. 
All right, other uh, comments or questions on item number 10? All right, Vince made the motion to approve item number 10 with the stipulations as listed. Second. Uh, Kelly seconded that motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item number 11. Item number 11 is a request by Dream Design International to create a tax increment financing district boundary and to adopt a project plan for the proposed Black Hills Industrial Center tax increment district. And this project is located generally east of South Dakota Highway 79 and south of Old Folsom Road. As a reminder, TIF is an economic development tool which captures, for a time, the increased tax revenue that occurs when public investment stimulates private investment. And this increased revenue is referred to as the increment, and it is placed into a special fund to help pay back the approved costs that are within a project plan. And the details of the project plan for this proposed district are what we'll be discussing today. The stated purpose for this application is to extend and develop a regional economic center and provide expanded city infrastructure into south of Rapid City. Key elements of this proposal are that it includes rail-served rail property that is slated for high-tech and value-added agricultural product industries. You may actually be familiar with the Acer Battery Company who has identified Rapid City as a location of their new battery plant. And Acer Battery will be the phase one anchor business of this district. Um, so as you know, all TIF districts are reviewed initially by the Tax Increment Financing Review Committee. The committee reviewed this project on March 1st of this year, and they did make a recommendation to staff that we proceed with bringing forward the resolutions and the project plan for review by the Planning Commission. Uh, following the review by the TIF committee, the applicant received additional comments from city staff with recommendations regarding um, their infrastructure pricing estimates and the likely need for water looping and other infrastructure uh, in order to ensure the soundness of the city's water system as a result of the development within the proposed district. So the applicant responded to those comments and revised their application to account for these comments. At the same time, they updated their own cost estimates to respond to price changes that are happening in the market as a result of current inflation. So as a result, the project costs have increased from about 46 million to about 78 million. However, the overall scope of the project has not changed substantially despite the 70% increase in costs. And on the table in front of you, you can see how that $32 million change is broken out with 5 million coming from city staff comments, 5 million, and these are approximations, um, coming from grading price revisions, 2 million for roadway work revisions, and 20 million coming from contingency financing and professional fees, um, with financing really making up the largest portion of that. So the table on the screen identifies some key similar similarities and differences between the original proposal reviewed by the TIF committee and the proposal that's um, before you today. Both proposals are said to result in nearly half a billion dollars of development. Um, and we'll be discussing that um, later as well. The applicant identified an additional 90 million in anticipated valuation with this revised request that you're looking at today. Um, and that is actually needed in order to demonstrate that the project will, uh, will pay off with the increase in costs. The anticipated job creation between the two, prosal, pr between the two proposals remains at over 2,000 jobs, um, and the project ask increases the total amount from $46 million to $78 million. Um, just for a quick visual, this is Exhibit A from both applications. If you were to compare these, you would find that the general project elements um, are very consistent between the two applications. This is Exhibit F from the application. This is showing the anticipated payroll of the center at full build out. There are a variety of types of jobs that are anticipated to be created, and the vast majority are earning about $45,000 a year. This graphic shows the boundary, the proposed boundary of the district. It includes over 900 acres in size. Just to point out, it includes right of way along 5th Street and Catron Boulevard, South Dakota Highway 79, as well as property owned by the city. This is the landfill, uh, and the state owns this lot. And of course, it in includes the private development lots um, located over in this area. Uh, you may note that there was some public comment submitted with regard to the inclusion of the city and state owned lots. 
And the reason for that is because some of the improvements within the proposed project plan, such as traffic signals, water mains, gas line, and electrical conduits, have components that could occur outside of the public right-of-way and may encroach into those publicly owned lots. So as a result of that, um, those lots are proposed to be included in the district so that those costs can remain in um, is part of the boundary. Uh, next series of slides um, are some site photos to further familiarize you with the site. Uh, this photograph was taken from Old Folsom Road looking to the south, generally in the same area looking to the east along Old Folsom Road. And take note of this road, there are project costs included in the application for this roadway. This is looking along Old Folsom Road as it curves toward the southeast. Here you can see the power lines and the rail line. And this image was taken further south along Old Folsom Road looking back towards the north. And again with the rail lines. This is the um, conceptual rendering that shows um, sort of a master plan of the proposed development as well as the costs that are proposed to be included. I realize with the scaling of this slide, um, some of these elements may not be uh, perfectly legible, but if you're following along on your, uh, on your tablet, you can look at these in a little more detail. Phase, so the project is going to occur in three phases. Phase one includes six and a half million dollars in grading. The grading for phase one is shown by this yellow boundary here. And I want to point out that the grading costs are inclusive of street, are inclusive of street grading as well as over lot grading. Um, grading is typically considered a private site improvement and not prioritized for TIF funding because these improvements lack a regional benefit component. Um, and you should be aware that grading is only allowed as an expense upon authorization by the city council. Phase one also includes $1 million for drainage facilities, $1.7 million for Old Folsom Road. Uh, the applicant has indicated that Old Folsom Road is anticipated to remain a rural road section. So thinking back to that site photo that we had on the screen earlier. An exception request not to install curb and gutter has been submitted, so the TIF request to improve Old Folsom Road uh, appears to be limited to asphalt overlay. Phase one also includes, includes turn lanes on South Dakota Highway 79 for 1.7 million, and 1.4 million is included for rail switches and rail lines. This rail infrastructure within the development is to be privately owned by the developer and to be used solely um, for this development, the Black Hills Industrial Center. They're not rail lines that are used um, for the community at large, but certainly will serve the businesses um, that are the developing within this area. Phase one also includes offsite sanitary sewer of $500,000, $500,000 for a traffic signal, and $200,000 for other utility relocations. Um, lastly, $400,000 for offsite water, and financing associated with phase one is about $7 million. Um, for phase two, we can see Acer Boulevard is a new street in this area, uh, projected at $5.3 million. There's an additional $1.2 million for rail lines and rail switches in phase two, $400,000 for offsite water, an additional traffic signal at $500,000, turn lanes for $400,000, other utility relocations uh, similar to the previous phase. This phase also includes construction of Creek Drive for $1.75 million and offsite sewer for $500,000. And phase two includes an estimated $11 million in financing. Lastly, phase three. So phase three is the area in purple. Uh, additional construction of Creek Drive at $920,000, drainage in the amount of $900,000, and $5.8 million for offsite water. And you'll notice a reference to this project component in the stipulations of the, pro of the staff report. Because of the water demands created by this development, construction of the water main is crucial to supply water from the regional booster station to the Palo Verde um, water main near Catron in Fifth. If the booster station is constructed within the TIF district, this component, the water main, must also be completed to limit adverse effects to the existing water system users. Phase three also includes $500,000 for a traffic signal, utility relocations similar to previous phases, the $3.6 million booster station, and $16 million for financing. Um, just to change to more of a table view, here you can see phase one total costs at $23.5 million, phase two at $24.2 million, and phase three at $30.2 million. Of the $78 million in this request, about $11 million could potentially be considered eventual city costs if not included in the district. Um, and those costs would include $6.2 million for the offsite water mains, 
500,000 for regional drainage ponds, 500,000 for a traffic signal, and 3.6 million for the booster station. Um, so as the Planning Commission is aware, there are typical developer costs for streets drainage and utilities with every development. And TIF plays a role in helping to pay for the oversized costs as well as typical developer fees when needed to make a project feasible. For this TIF request, the applicant has included $36.7 million for infrastructure construction costs and has identified $4.5 million of non-TIF funded infrastructure construction costs. So these non-TIF costs have not been itemized for staff review, but they do represent about 12% of the project infrastructure costs with the TIF paying for the rest. Um, again, here another slide that's not necessarily intended to be visible um, on the screen, but if you're following along on your tablet, this is Exhibit D that was submitted with the original application. And what we're looking at here is what the phases of development are proposed to translate to in terms of increased value that will pay off the district. So they've got their phases of development by year here and the types of development that will occur. With the original proposal, they identified $190 million of valuation going towards paying off the TIF by around year 2039. With the revised application, um, they're showing you know, the same development, but they're also showing additional development, including a plastic and medical manufacturing facility. And with the addition of that development, the anticipated value of the district now is $280 million. So $90 million over what they initially um, thought might occur, and, and that's the added valuation that makes it possible for the district to pay off with a 70% increase in costs. Um, with the revised increased costs, we are anticipating that the TIF um, will take close to the 20 years that are allowed by state law to pay off. And that's a good transition into some of the projections that are um, being understood, some of the underlying assumptions of this district. The five lots that are located within the district have a current valuation, 2022 valuation, of just over a million dollars. And we're using the 2021 tax levies to um, make our estimates about how this will um, amortize over time. The applicant has indicated an end valuation of a half a billion dollars. So the amortization schedule kind of digs into the interest a little bit further and looks at how those um, loan payments are going to come out over each of the three phases. And overall, the applicant is estimating and including in the project plan $34.8 million in financing fees. Overall, this accounts for about up to half of the anticipated entire project costs. Next series of slides are going to go through some of the key elements from state statute and Rapid City TIF policy and how they align with the proposed project. Starting with state statute, um, it requires that 25% of the area um, is blighted or not less than 50% will stimulate economic welfare with the industrial uses that this development will be promoting and with the job creation, of course, the economic development com component is there. And the, applica the applicant is also citing um, several several areas where the blight definition um, applies to their project as well, including unsafe transportation system um, and lack of safe roads and utilities in the area. Rapid City's TIF policy identifies several you know, purposes for TIF, reasons we would want to prioritize using TIF, economic development being um, key among them. TIF policy also identifies what the preferred uses of TIF are. Um, for this application, we're looking at extension of that offsite water to the development site, the booster station, uh, as well as interest in financing fees, professional service fees, and the administrative fee that's due to the city. The TIF policy also looks at costs that are uh, available, that are eligible at the discretion of the governing body if they're found to be necessary and convenient to the creation of the district. For this project plan, the rail lines and the rail switches really fit into that category because, as I mentioned earlier, they are to be privately owned um, and to be used for this development. And I will just point out that you know, the TIF policy identifies oversizing as an eligible expense. With this proposal, the costs are not identified as typical costs, oversizing costs, exceptional costs in an itemized way. So we're not really able to extrapolate that out. Um, but based on the previous chart that I showed, we are expecting that the TIF is really paying for um, just under 90% of the entirety of the infrastructure costs. Um, 
This slide talks about which costs in the TIF policy are allowed only upon authorization by the Rapid City Council, and again, that goes to the street grading and the overlot grading. There are criteria for evaluation within Rapid City's TIF policy. It looks again at economic development, the blight, which we've already discussed, and it also talks about how the project must comply with the city's comprehensive plan. Um, of note for this project, goal EC-3.1 encourages employment growth in targeted community locations, and this includes the old Folsom Road industrial area. Additional criteria in the city's TIF policy is that the project must demonstrate that it is not economically feasible without the use of TIF. In their application, the developers note that the proposed industrial center cannot be done without TIF funding due to abnormal grading, major arterial streets, large water mains crossing into two water pressure zones, and large regional detention ponds. And the topic of economic feasibility is related to another very important section of the project plan, which is the analysis of the impact to the taxing agencies. So that would be the county, the water district, and the city. Within the project report, there's a table summarizing the anticipated diversion of tax revenue um, from those taxing agencies towards the development during the life of the TID. And it is understood by the decision makers when reviewing a TIF district proposal that the development will only occur but for the TID. And because of that, the temporary loss of revenue, uh, which is quite sizable for a district of this size and magnitude, is justifiable because of the net gain at the end of the project that would not otherwise be possible. If we look at Exhibit E within the application further, you'll note um, the applicant's stated annual rate of return for each phase of development. For phase one, excuse me, phase one, they're showing a 6.12% rate of return without the TIF and a 7.5% rate of return with the TIF. For phase two, a loss of $21 million uh, versus net proceeds of $2.378 million with the TIF. For phase three, a $25 million loss is shown without the TIF and $4.8 million in proceeds with the TIF. And then just to finish up with some of the additional criteria in the TIF policy, uh, we look at expanded employment opportunities, whether the project competes with existing businesses, and whether actual poten or potential hazards will be eliminated. So to summarize, this TIF request is for up to $78 million to fund developer costs as well as public infrastructure associated with creating a 600-acre industrial center with anticipated job creation of 2,000 employees. If the Planning Commission recommends approval of the district and the project plan to the City Council, staff recommends that you do so with the stipulations that are outlined in the staff report. And I am available for any questions you have. Thank you, Sarah. That's a very in-depth uh, presentation for a large project. Um, any questions for her? Haven? This property was just uh, annexed into the city. Is where the, where's the uh, city limit on one of your photos there? Where, where, can you show us where the edge of the city is? Yeah, that's a good question. You are correct. This property was just annexed in. So the city boundary actually follows the district boundary quite closely in that, um, so th this portion was obviously already, was already in the city. Um, but this portion here represents the new city limits. And I, and I guess this shows it. It looks like the TIF application would include Catron from 5th to 79, and then the intersection there, and then down 79 to the property. I, I guess that probably shows that fairly clearly. That's correct. And the reason that that right-of-way is included is for this project component here. You can see this blue line. Um, that's the extension of that water main. In order to make that water main connection from here to here, that right-of-way has to be included in the district boundary. And I'm trying to um, simulate the issue of incorporating the landfill into this TIF. Um, maybe you could explain that a little better or more so. I know you, you talked about it a little bit, but uh, that seems a little bit unusual that that would be included in this TIF area. 
Yes, of course. So um, along this area, there's multiple public improvements proposed. There's traffic signals, turning lanes, as well as the extension of um, utilities such as gas line, tele telecommunication lines, and the like. Some of those improvements may require um, encroachment either outside or slightly outside of that right-of-way area. If these lots were not included in the district boundary, those costs would be ineligible. So in order to include those costs, they have to uh, be sure to include all of the land for which the construction would occur. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, access, is there any additional access uh, planned south of Old Folsom Road? Or is that the only access to this area? Yep, good question. So this is shown as um, Acer Boulevard. So this will be a new industrial street connecting through here. And then Creek Drive in this direction heading to the south. So the first one will be accessed then out to 79. Yep, so f um, here from Highway 79 to Old Folsom Road. And then the second from Highway 79 to uh, proposed Acer Boulevard. And then thirdly, Creek Drive. Okay. And then even further, the late, a later phase um, extension of Lamb Road this direction, but that's, Lamb Road isn't. Karen? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sarah, I just have some uh, questions, comments, or whatever on the staff report. Okay. <clears throat> on uh, the f page four, you had talked about the very last sentence is without further elaboration. It's unclear what, if any improvements are proposed besides asphalt overlay, and that's on Folsom Road. But I noticed within the project plan, you could see that there were some other things that they were going to do, like uh, water or utilities, whatever. So I was unclear on that statement. So. Yeah, well, we were um, noticing that some of those same project components are also incorporated in other parts of what they're itemizing with utilities. So that's why it was, we just wanted to put it out there that the improvements to Old Folsom Road, as we understood it, were to include utilities and asphalt overlay. But, we're not, but it won't include curb and gutter, as far as we know, because they've, accept, they've requested an exception to that. OK, so there will be the other, other things other than the curb and gutter that will be put into Old Folsom Road. Um, utilities. Utilities, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, OK. That was my first comment, question. I know that the staff all of you have looked at this in depth, I would assume, and especially the engineering components and make sure that it's, it's within reason of the costs that are gonna go in there. Um, but I also noticed that um, all the in things that are within the uh, site that are developer owned and, and is typical, typically not included in a, in a TIF, um, but by uh, the council approving that plan. If we approve it and the council approves it, they're saying that it's okay to have that go through. We're not si saying it specifically. We're not outlining it in the, uh, you know, like a stipulation or anything like that. But I assume that that's what that means. Yes, those the the TIF policy outlines you know costs that are sort of prioritized for use of TIF and then other costs that you know, that we can be flexible on, that we can look at on a case-by-case -case basis. In this instance, the applicant has identified um, several different types of project components that fall within that latter category. Yeah, I noticed that too. And I can understand, I mean, putting a rail lines in and the, the scope of this is so large that they would want those in there. And, and as long as the council says it's okay, you know, that's, that's what I want to make sure. Um, then you also had something about a booster station. You, made a comment about if the booster station is needed. And is that something that will come as it's developed and you know whether there's not enough water, they'll need a booster station? Yes, thank you for the question. I should clarify that and make that um, more clear. The booster station is needed for the development, so we don't expect that not to occur. We expect the booster station will be constructed. We do see with TIF developments from time to time that um, not all project co components that are in the project plan actually are constructed within the five-year timeline you know, we see that happen. In this instance, if that booster station is constructed, which we expect it will be, it's critical for the city's water system that the water main also be included. So we want to kind of tag those two um, project components together to say if the booster station is built, the water main must also be built. 
Okay, and that should occur it, within the first five years also. Yep, and that would be, uh, the um, arrangements of that would be handled through the developer's agreement. Gotcha, okay. And then I have one last question on the stipulations under item three. Um, I guess that was about the booster station. I was trying to think of what, why I had that out there, but that was the reason. It says that, um, uh, it doesn't say who supplies or who is gonna pay for that, but I assume that the developer would have to pay for the booster station and the other stuff. It just wasn't clear to me that it was a developer that was supposed to pay for that. And, and I didn't know if you needed that in that stipulation or not. on page nine of your staff report? Number three. Oh yes, uh, stipulation number three is related um, to the previous question about the water main and the booster station um, being paired together. Okay. And that would be the cost of the developer just like part of the project plan? Okay. Correct, up, up front and then the TIF pays it back. Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay. I. Overall, I, uh, this is an aggressive TIF. I mean, it's a real large TIF, you know, one of the largest ones we've had. And, and I co commend you and the staff for all the work you did to get it to this point. It's uh, complicated and, and uh, it's, it's done very well. I think the project plan's put together really well. So I hope this goes through and 20 years is a long time. I hope I, I'm around to pay, see it pay off, but who knows? <laughs> but anyway. Thank you for bringing it forward to us. Thanks. Vince? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and that's exactly what I was gonna ask, Carrie, and I had some questions about the booster. Uh, and uh, so that answered that. I don't need, we don't need to go over that again. You clarified that pretty well for me. Uh, I do agree with Karen and, and the size and scope of this project. And deferred payment is always hard at the beginning, but it does pay off eventually. Uh, I did have one other question about the drainage pond or uh, that has to be built. Can you, can you clarify for that for me? Who's paying for that and, and how is that going about? Um, the drainage is being funded okay. through the development. Uh, there's costs included in phase one um, and phase three. Oh, okay, thank you, that's it. Eric Heikus. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chair. This is commendable work by both Dream Design and the time that staff put in reviewing this. Good job, Sarah. Um, and the presentation was excellent. Uh, the notion of value-added agriculture, I think, is a particular concern. The region is ripe for that. And uh, oil seeds crushing or legume finishing would be a great um, addition to our economic aspect of our community. We're only about 20 years behind the curve, but this is a step in the right direction. Um, I appreciate that very much, and I know that the agricultural community also appreciates this aspect. The proximity to rail is significant for that reason. So um, my question is uh, really simple, and I'm assuming a traffic impact study is a process of this down the road a bit, but um, has there been any um, recent discussion or something you could uh, add to that? Um, as far as traffic impact, Sarah? The, so the applicant has submitted a preliminary subdivision plan um, for this project as part of platting. So as the development um, proceeds, the traffic impact study um, will be associated with that. Okay. Vicki, is there anything you want me to add to that? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. All right, I do have a speaker request form from Kyle Trelore, if you'd like to say anything. That's what you get for having a dress rehearsal when it doesn't work. Oh, 
hope there's a light and sound show that comes with this as well. Kyle Treloro with uh, Dream Design International. I, I think I want to echo a lot of the comments that, that uh, the Planning Commission has had today. This is a, a large, aggressive TIF. This is a large, aggressive TIF. Uh, it's exciting. This is, this is new um, potential businesses. This is new uh, industries being added to Rapid City. Um, staff has done an amazing job of working with us and, and coming and in, in making this plan as, as complete as we possibly can at this point. Um, a lot of what has been talked about, the, the value-added ag and working with, with that sector, you know, bringing some of our, our local goods that we produce here and being able to produce them here and then export them out instead of vice versa, exporting and then, then bringing them back in. These are the, exactly what we're, we're going for here, the Acer battery plant with that whole new industry that's, that's going to be a cornerstone of, of this development. Um, we did put together a, a quick um, presentation, which is a video style. I'd like to play that. It, it kind of gives a different view of what the development is instead of just the static, you know, looking down at the paper. It uh, provides a little more of a three-dimensional flyover just to help visualize the entire project. So I'd like to show that, and then mostly if there's any questions that, that result or that you have after this, we're more than happy to answer them. Thank you. Located along the Heartland Express, just south of Katrin Boulevard, and a short drive from Rapid City Regional Airport, is the Black Hills Industrial Center. The center will be home to many technology and value-added agricultural industries to address our regional and national needs. This location has a strategic advantage in reliable power sources and uninterrupted access to the railroad. Industries will create an innovative environment to capture the talented graduates from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology. Value-added agriculture will be a focus of the development, opening new markets to South Dakota's largest industry. Industry leaders in technology and manufacturing have shown interest in the project and are making commitments to make this site a home for their business. This includes Acer Technology. They are constructing a $120 million facility to produce state-of-the-art batteries, meeting the demands of the rapidly growing renewable energy and technology industry. The center will provide more than 2,000 professional jobs that will improve the regional wage scale and enhance the quality of life within the Black Hills. The center will complement the mission at Ellsworth Air Force Base and provide reliable employment for families of enlisted men and women. Dream Design is proud to partner with local and state governments to bring the largest industrial development in Rapid City's history. It will transform our regional economy and help protect our natural resources and the environment of the Black Hills. Thank you. I, I don't see any others, so I'm going to hop in with one quick question. I, I think I already know the answer to this, but this is a big swing on the uh, uh, scale of development in Rapid City. It, the risk, though, of these funding these uh, pieces if the tax revenue doesn't support the payoff, that lies with the developer, correct? That's correct. Our TIFs are developer funded upfront. So if the TIF doesn't pay off, those loans will be accountable to the developer. All right. And shows the level of confidence that they have in this. So I appreciate that. Kelly? Thank you. Um, I have two quick questions. One, the landfill is included in this TIF. What, what, how will that benefit? What will apply, you know, for infrastructure? Can you explain, you know, how that correlates to the, to the big plan? Yeah, and I might defer to the applicants too if, if there's a better way to describe this. But the, some of the improvements that are slated to occur in the right of way along the landfill could extend just slightly beyond that right of way boundary. So technically in the, in the lot owned by the city or by the state, um, but not necessarily improvements, you know, for the landfill. Fair to say, Chair. Do you want to add anything? <coughs> if I might. Okay, sure. So it, it's been on the horizon for some time that access into the landfill needs to be signalized. If any of you visited it, you see turning movements <laughs> and difficulty sometimes getting out and making that left-hand turn. Um, this TIF will cover that expenditure, which will be a benefit to the city as a whole. Um, again, there's a, another connection to 
uh, 79 further south. That too is projected to be signalized and including that at this time, if not a benefit to the city, is a benefit to the state uh, because those infrastructure uh, demands as they rise fall upon us to ensure that we've got safe traveling movements and having those be a part of the TIF saves the taxpayers long term. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that is a problem. Every Saturday you see that. So it's pretty much restrict, it's re uh, restricted to access, in other words, in and out of the landfill. Can I hop in, Kelly, and just ask a similar question? So you can only put a TIF boundary on a parcel boundary, correct? There have been instances, I'll take that one, there have been instances in the past where a TIF boundary will split a lot. It makes doing the tax rolls very complicated because you're diverting some taxes from the lot and not other, and how do you do the math on that? So um, the equalization department from the county really prefers that if you have a lot in a TIF boundary, it's the entire lot. So in this case, even if we go a foot into the dump, we're just drawing the line on the parcel of the dump? Does Correct. that make Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. Sorry, those I, that we've seen TIFs where we've allowed just a portion of a property to be in and out, those are, that's usually undeveloped land. So the valuation becomes a little easier for us to determine what should go towards the TIF and what should stay outside of it. Um, that's not the case here. It would be difficult to determine um, on, on some of these other properties. So it just it bodes well to just include the whole boundary. Sorry about that, Kelly. No, that's, no, no, that's great. My other question was in environmental. When it's TIF related, you know, who's the arbiter oversees the environmental regulations? Is it a federal standard, a state, a city, a combination, or is it uh, industry uh, driven? Let's defer to Todd. Okay. Todd? <coughs> I think so. Um, environmental, as far as like wetlands and stuff like that, is uh, that's by the state. Um, DANR and so that's what this project uh, is going to include work on uh, in the wetlands on the floodplain uh, floodplain remapping and so all of that work in, in the wetlands that that are impacted will be um, permitted by the state okay as far as the industrial you know industrial complex you're gonna have emissions etc runoff is that part of the wetlands package or is it uh, the industrial stuff it depends so that's kind of what I was leaning as far as the uh, any wastewater we have a industrial wastewater permit that they would get through through our um, through a, a different division of public works they would permit that okay. it depends on on what their what their use is and what they're discharging okay so and air air emissions is that covered in the same blanket or no, we don't have any. We have an air quality specialist more for dust and stuff like that. Um, okay. Because, I mean, at this point, there's no there's no division of who will occupy each lot. So, I mean, if, if there's a, who knows, you know, a nuclear power plant, you know, then yeah, be, I'm just kind of asking about the environmental impact of this. I think it would be complex. Um, uh, specific to that development on that lot as far as what they're doing which we don't I mean other than the battery plant we don't have any information on okay case by case in other words. yep okay thanks mr. chair if I might so as the developer is looking at moving dirt uh, and such Todd's statement is absolutely correct they will work with the state on on those regulations uh, whether it be wetlands and working with the Corps of Engineers etc when it comes to the individual development whether it's an in industrial wastewater permit or an air quality permit, those are then reviewed and regulated by the city. So we go hand in hand with each other, but at the end of the day before they get that certificate of occupancy, they've addressed all of those concerns and have the necessary permits in place. Haven? Now to clarify for me and maybe some others in the room, uh, if the uh, application is approved by the Planning Commission this morning, what? are the next steps that the applicant must take. Mr. Chair, <clears throat> thank you, Haven. I should have mentioned that in the report. The next step, if the Planning Commission recommends approval, is review by the City Council. Prior to it going to a City Council hearing, there's a set for agenda to provide additional public notice, um, but ultimately it would be headed next to City Council for final approval. All right, other questions or comments on item number 11? 
All right. Vince made the motion to approve item number 11 and the resolution to create a tax increment finance district with the four stipulations as listed. Is there a second to the motion? Second. All right. Karen seconded the motion. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. That takes us to the end of our regular agenda today. Are there discussion items? Staff Mr. Items? Chair, um, at a previous meeting, you had asked Public Works for an update on Eglin Street, as we were noting concerns with traffic in the Rushmore Crossing area. Um, I don't know if Todd is prepared to present that today. I can just give an update as far as what, okay. what our plan is. Um, I think Vince asked if there was a plan on Eglin Street. Uh, so I, uh, so I did visit with our design group who manages our CIP program. We have funding in 2025 for a study. So it's a couple years out. And then 2028 for uh, improvements to increase the capacity, uh, primarily from East North Street to the West. Um, that's where we're having our capacity issues right now. So that study will look at the intersection improvements at East North um, and then how far any widening has to go, potentially all the way over to Luna. Uh, but, but that's what the study is going to address. And if there's any additional signals that are needed, uh, target, the entrance into target is the only one that is close to, to meeting any warrants. And so then if it's determined that that's needed, then. Uh, so so that, there I mean, won't be, there, there's no potential change prior to 25? That's when the study will be done. Right. 2028 is actual when we have money. So. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Personally, I'm much more concerned about the entrance to the dump, but that just tells you what my traffic pattern is. <laughs> <laughs> Any other staff items today, Becky? Not today. Any planning commission items? All right, I'd look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. All right, Vince made the motion. Karen seconded the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.